It's great to be here and talk a bit on lead by example. That was uh, what I've been asked to. And then I think uh, Sonja or someone else put in modern research data management in chemistry. But actually, um, I would like to talk about pragmatic uh, research data management in chemistry. And you will see in a moment where the distinction might be. And the point is basically that pragmatic you can do today. So um, the slides are put together from a, a number of different talks by different people and um, cases. Uh, so uh, it's probably more a discussion that I would like to run. So if you have any questions, please uh, shout in, interrupt me at any time, um, because it's, it's a bit more like a, a slide guided discussion and not so much the classic research talk that we're gonna have here. And I think I will also have a few slides where I will explicitly stop and be asking the audience about their experience. So be warned. Um, QR code at the uh, upper right uh, and the link will get you to my slides um, in case you want to go back to that uh, at some later stage. Okay, so briefly, the uh, IPB, uh, Leibniz Institute of Black Biochemistry, has been established uh, many decades ago. Uh, we are situated here in uh, Halle Saale, about an hour on the train from uh, Berlin, and very close to Leipzig down here. And depending on how you count, there is, uh, among the researchers, um, about 10 to 20 bio and chem informaticians. So, you might have seen the NFT I4Chem vision slide uh, a few times where basically the data life cycle starts from the experiment design uh, through performing the experiment, processing and analysis of the data, publication, and then eventually reuse. What I would like to do today is to start with the reuse because uh, you can um, manage and publish uh, all the data that you want. Really, the reuse is what you should be thinking about because that's where the value is. Otherwise, you will just have dead bits uh, sitting uh, somewhere. So how do we get good reuse? Um, in the following, uh, I will in particular focus on molecules and uh, spectral information. But the same will hold true also for the other things that we care about in uh, the NFTI for chem. So there is plenty of publications out there, plenty of supplemental information. So what's wrong with it? Um, well, a lot. Um, so if you have supplemental information where you have structures, uh, they are nice to look at and all the chemists will uh, right away get uh, the idea about what that compound is, but you can't do anything with that. You can't calculate the weight without uh, putting that uh, together in, in your own uh, drawing uh, program. Um, if there is spectra associated in a PDF, um, you may get an idea and you may see the uh, one of the peaks there. But if you want to zoom into the smaller ones, then they are basically dead when it comes to uh, PDF data. So this is uh, two or three slides that I took from um, a journal club where I was talking about uh, some uh, very cool uh, chemoinformatics work where somebody else was doing uh, deep learning and some really cool things for natural product research. And um, basically the setting of that paper was uh, that you do some experiment there might be a toxic fraction somewhere. And then the question, the typical question is, what are those compounds in there? What could be the toxic one? And there's spectral data um, associated with that uh, fraction. And then the um, structure elucidation and identification comes about. There is a lot more stuff uh, that was done in these uh, papers that I'm not uh, going about. Uh, that's where the chemists come in. That's where. Um, the real science is, I'll skip over that. And I will also skip over the computer science parts uh, that happened in there. Basically, what they did was they were using neural networks. Uh, somewhere in that part of the picture, there was deep learning, which is today sometimes uh, also termed as AI. Or if you ask a computer scientist, then it's just machine learning. Um, uh, and 
What you need for that is training data, lots of training data. And in that case, the training data consists of pairs of NMR, spectra, and the corresponding structures. So where do you get such a large training body? Of course, you can go to the uh, published papers and journals on that. So that's what the people did. Um, they were going to some journals. Uh, this is taken from the supplement information uh, of uh, the article I'm talking about. And I was crying out when I read that they were using some software to convert the PDF into pixel images and then use Photoshop to remove things like the axis and the frames and anything else to come up with that is the training data that they needed. So since we are in the 21st century, uh, I think that really shouldn't be the case. And that would be one wonderful example of why we want to have um, data, living data and not dead data in uh, trapped in a PDF. So my question to the audience now is, um, what other cases of data reuse in chemistry have you uh, been aware of? Do you know anything maybe that did not happen because the data was not available? It was published, but you couldn't get it. Um, so you could drop anything into the chat. So there is plenty of cases out there where reuse can and should happen. Um, Great, so back to the vision. Now we come to the disclosure and publication part of that data life cycle. Um, the reasons to do that uh, is uh, various and multifold. There are uh, benefits uh, for you. Um, I think the most important ones uh, to do many of the researchers are possibly increased citation rates. We have seen that in some fields that with data citations uh, are increased. Uh, you might get uh, new collaborators who stumble upon uh, that data and think that uh, you're, um, one could build upon that and work together with that um, and uh, so on. Um, there's also mentioned the research community and that is actually um, more than the research community in general. It could also be your own Arbeitskreis. It could also be the people uh, at your university and around. So, um, that will really help to do uh, more collaborations if the data is out there. And it's also um, uh, sharing the data within your um, own Arbeitskreis uh, helps the, the next PhD students afterwards to build uh, upon that. So uh, there's really different sizes and uh, scales of community uh, meant here. So the, uh, we have been talking about the FAIR uh, acronym for quite a while. You could consider that a bit of a buzzword, but um, I'd like to turn that around and, and talk about uh, things that are not FAIR and not open. Basically, then a lot of information is lost. And in particular, you lose the relation between the experiment and the data. That uh, is less clear. But we also acknowledge that uh, creating good data doesn't come for free. It is something you need to think about uh, to do it well. It needs to be become an established procedure. But um, I would say that the same is true for clean work in the lab. That also doesn't come for free. And to do good synthesis, to do good extractions and so on, you also need to put uh, quite some effort to make good science. And good data management is part of that good scientific practice. So um, cases where published data is dead as well, uh, that would be an example we have seen here. Somebody was printing out something, putting in some notes, and then scanning it back in. That's readable for humans, but not machine readable. Um, similarly here, uh, we would have some structures, again, not machine readable, some information there. And uh, on top of it, uh, there's even a typo uh, somewhere in there. So if you're looking for um, solids, then you will not find that particular yellow solid uh, when you just search for that. 
Um, slightly better from a uh, perspective of NMR, there is uh, the data being assigned in little peaks to um, the, the structure and, and the bonds. But again, it's a PDF table and it's not machine readable and you will even have a hard time cut and pasting such uh, a table layout to uh, be able to reuse that later. And one of the solutions would be to put uh, the data in a repository uh, or database. In that case, it is uh, NMR ShiftDB, which has been around for quite some time. And then from there, it can also be exported as NMR eData, which is a machine readable uh, data that is exchangeable. You can load that into software, you can reuse that. You could do machine learning if you had thousands of those. So that is really where we would like to go to be able to reuse things. Another example, a paper published uh, at the IPB, they were doing some uh, modeling of uh, protein structures and then down there in the figure, they would give you the identifier, the pointer to where the data had been deposited. You could go to that repository and download uh, the exact very three-dimensional structure. You could use that for docking procedures. You can use it for um, energy calculations, whatever you want. So that is what enables reuse afterwards. So how do we get data published? Um, we have, um, as mentioned, the manuscripts. And then from the manuscripts, you can uh, put the uh, supporting data in its own right into whatever repositories we have out there. There's a number of uh, generic ones that I'll come to uh, in a moment. And especially in my field, there would be uh, quite a number of dedicated and subdiscipline specific ones. Uh, so they also exist. And then they will have the benefit that the data is much better at home in, in so uh, those uh, specific repositories. And you might get uh, some added benefit by some data analysis being directly attached to the data that is submitted by people. What you also see in that um, figure here is that there are some journals out there that are taking care specifically about data publications. So it's not just uh, that you have a scientific manuscript and you attach some supplemental information, but there is a number of journals coming up uh, that are taking care particularly of interesting and valuable data sets um, independent of the scientific discovery that you may have made uh, with that. Uh, scientific data is from uh, Springer Nature. And uh, just a few uh, months ago, they changed their um, chief editor. He is now um, a chemist uh, by training. So I could imagine they will also be looking forward to uh, chemistry data sets. So those generic repositories, I mentioned a few times, uh, you might know Figshare have come across that, Zenodo is uh, a quite a popular one, and a few more. Um, there are catalogs indexing uh, the repositories themselves so that you can search for specific ones. I was just recently after uh, one of the uh, lectures I gave, uh, I was asked for something on imaging or ion data, and I was able to find something in those um, repository search engine. So that would be quite uh, valuable. I think in that case, I found things in the fair sharing, which is hosted and operated by a uh, British uh, consortium at University of Oxford. There is a special one, and I know that we already had a Stammtisch on that uh, earlier this year. So uh, radar for chem uh, has been launched. It was just yesterday able to log into that and uh, have a look around. Um, this is meant for the long tail of science, so they are not discipline specific. Uh, there is no particular requirements on, um, on uh, how you uh, upload the data to that. The data will get a DOI, so it's citable, and it's uh, hosted and based here in Germany. Previously in the RADA, uh, it was required that your institution would be a contractual uh, member with the RADAR consortium, and that is not the case with radar for chem So that's really open to our entire community. So what do things look like down there in RADAR? Uh, we have an example here, a paper from uh, IPB, some natural product uh, chemistry. 
uh, you see also that the paper has a DOI. Now that's totally commonplace nowadays. And the Daten Paket, the supplemental data for that also comes with the DOI and it's living in RADA. And if you now look into such generic repositories, what most of them really do is you can think of them as hosting a directory of data files. And in uh, the majority of cases, uh, the actual research data you put there, there is little structure, no structure prescribed. So it is up to you uh, to uh, have a nicely and well-structured data package rather than just dumping uh, all your data over the fence and then let other people deal with it. So in that case, uh, we had uh, natural product uh, chemistry, there was some synthesis involved, um, and we have NMR and MS data uh, on uh, the um, compounds that were uh, created. So uh, it was actually Tillman um, Fisher, one of the first things he did here to assemble corresponding data package to, uh, together with uh, Tony Ditfer. And uh, we made sure that we have all the MS and the NMR data. IPB is running a kind of core facility, uh, you could uh, call it. So the data was already uh, available in a central place, uh, but still people had to go back and check out what was exactly the NMR file corresponding to a particular structure and so on. So that was what really took most of the time. You see the data is there twice. So there's the vendor format, which is exactly what came off the instrument. And then we also have open formats like uh, the MZML format for uh, mass spectrometry so that you can read that in uh, with the uh, most open software out there and you don't require to have the waters uh, software, no thermot wasn't in that case. You don't uh, need to have the thermal software installed of your computer to reuse that particular data. Um, we also gave in many cases both uh, the um, Excel sheet or the plain CSV uh, for uh, the same data. You also see that we avoided to have complex table layouts. So sometimes people are using Excel to be very creative and they put in different blocks of information here and there. They might put in additional graphics and figures. And if you want to read that as a data matrix later on, that might cause problem because uh, the computer will be looking at it uh, and it will expect a data matrix. And if there is, uh, let's say, um, creative ways uh, to do the uh, table, then the computer will be uh, highly confused. There is uh, something that is uh, the IPB internal identifier that we have here. Then there is the compound as it is named in the manuscript. So there is uh, always a mapping there. And then uh, we have uh, the particular, um, yeah, in that case, it would be the essay data on Phytophthora infestants and a few other um, essays that were run on, on the data. So raw instrument data, this would now be the uh, NMR uh, data that we have in there. And again, you see that we have um, a particular file name convention and really um, all the sites uh, running uh, NMR should have some best practices on how they want to uh, create the file names. In this case, there is links to the uh, corresponding lab notebook where people were describing uh, what something is. And then afterwards for this data deposition, we also included the number of the compound in the corresponding paper into the file name. And of course, within, uh, you will also find the variant um, files, the, the specific ones for FID or processing parameters and so on. So take home message there is uh, to really go with good file name practices, naming practices, and uh, especially to be consistent so that uh, the file naming is not depending on who was running up to the instrument, and doing something uh, and acquiring data, because only then uh, you will be able to search for that retrospectively, uh, have a look at all the files that were created by a particular PhD student and so on. Uh, similarly, we have the processed data for the NMR stuff. So there would be uh, particular individual 
JCAM DX uh, files for the actual spectra. We had the assignments done with ANOVA. Uh, they were also put out there. And I think that one down here is an NMR eData zip file, um, which is one of the open formats for uh, NMR. Just a, a few examples here. You see at the bottom, we have the link to the NFDI for CAM uh, knowledge base where we're starting to assemble uh, information and knowledge. And there is one page uh, done by David Rao on the uh, data formats and standards. So for uh, mass spectrometry would have MZML as mentioned, NMR might have NMR eData. And the JCAM DX uh, that you saw before can actually uh, capture multiple types of spectra uh, and is uh, developed and maintained by the IUPAC. Okay, uh, another um, table we have put into the data that has the numbered compounds because from the number alone you have no idea what that compound is. So you could go back into the manuscript to see what it is, but then you would only find uh, the image there. So what you need is a machine readable way of um, uh, capturing the structure. In this case, we have uh, some of that even within that table, capturing the smiles and the inchi, and the inchi key just uh, for convenience as well. And all these uh, will give you uh, identifiers and uh, the structure. Um, you can additionally put in the chemical structures as mole or SDF file. That would in particular be required if uh, the uh, smiles or inchi are not a very good match uh, for your particular structures. And how do you get those? I ah, know, not yet. Um, so I hope I didn't. I hope I didn't uh, kill that. If I did killed that slide, then uh, rest assured, we also have a knowledge base article that is giving you um, uh, some instructions how to use uh, your favorite uh, chemical drawing programs to actually create those smiles and inches because nobody would expect you to type them just like that. Okay, so we have the data so far, and um, we uh, also would like to have in that data package uh, the provenance information. So how you got there, how something was synthesized and so on. So that is very similar to uh, what people already put into the um, supplemental, supplemental information um, to the manuscript, but it doesn't harm to also put that into the data set itself so that it is all self-contained uh, and uh, in a single place. And actually we realized that uh, only afterwards, we forgot to do that for the Hygrophorons uh, publication that I was just showing. So this would benefit from having such uh, provenance uh, information. Um, and if the I for Chem will support you uh, if you have questions towards that uh, data publication and if you don't have anyone around in your lab. Um, and that could be as simple as uh, asking us uh, some question and there could be some consulting. Uh, but we've also had cases where uh, somebody from NFDI for, for Chem was digging much deeper into that, trying to uh, also helping out to convert the data and putting uh, individual things together, maybe going from uh, drawn structures to the machine readable ones and so on. Uh, so that uh, is also possible. And that goes a bit more into the direction of data stewardship or collaborations. We can help you to find the uh, raw data formats for uh, your particular types uh, of instrumentation. So we had uh, a person running around in our institute trying to figure out for each machine, what can we actually export as file formats from there? Because sometimes people are um, a bit overwhelmed by the vendor software and not always looking into what uh, formats could be exported from that. And uh, we also keeping um, lists of what software could actually be then consuming uh, such data. Um, we may be of help choosing uh, the appropriate repositories. Of course, there's the catch all generic repositories like the radar for chem that I mentioned, but we also have extensive um, experience with the Chemotion repository in, in some of the partners. 
and uh, we also know a few more uh, specific and dedicated repositories elsewhere. If you want uh, such help, either from a current or even a future publication, uh, you can uh, contact us. You can uh, get in touch with the help desk saying, well, I would love to ask for help. And uh, we also have a form uh, set up, uh, which is uh, shown here on the right on lead by example or leading by example. Um, where you can give a bit more background information of your uh, data set and then we can approach you and try to uh, see if uh, there is any help needed somewhere. In the end, uh, we are collecting uh, data sets to be presented uh, on the knowledge base. Ah, and that is the slide I was uh, referring to earlier. Um, there we have the information on how to use your favorite drawing programs to get the uh, machine readable uh, chemical structures. Um, and uh, we are also going to present a few examples of pairs of um, publications and data sets uh, on the knowledge base. So that is all growing. Currently, we have seven articles on that uh, or seven data set pairs uh, already collected there. Uh, there is plenty more out and uh, we are keeping that list growing. So one of the messages I had briefly mentioned at the beginning is really that the research data management should become a standard operating procedure in your lab, where you had previously or in the old days that people were doing the experiment, doing stuff, doing things on the instruments, analyzing the data, writing the manuscript, and then it became apparent that uh, somebody is asking them to also provide the data. More and more publications, uh, journals are asking for that in the author guidelines. And then people would go back, try to put together the data, convert that into some of the open formats, get into the uh, lab notebooks and get more uh, information about the individual samples before they eventually can then deposit that onto one of the repositories out there and then give that reference uh, in the manuscript. And instead, if you think of the data management as these bluish lilac thingies here, really when you do the wet lab, right away, keep a bit of information around already in the format and structure that you will need eventually later on. Do the experiments and already um, benefit from having the data structured for maybe you do some statistical analysis as well um, so that when you uh, write a manuscript, the data is already in a shape that can be deposited to the repositories um, and, and uh, published together with uh, the manuscript in the end. Um, we also had cases, and that was what I was mentioning earlier, uh, where people have been taking data from the repositories doing data reuse and they got a few more articles uh, that were not even competing with the original ones but they were getting additional information out there trying different questions on the same types of data so that was really the valuable reuse that gives me a smile when i see that happening so indeed in the future development, RDM goes into the uh, workflows. Uh, you uh, integrate that into the lab, uh, manage the data as it's produced, because it also raises the quality of your data um, in, in the lab uh, in a whole. That also needs that supervisors kind of pay attention to that, and they need to encourage and value that you do that. Uh, sometimes uh, they would only give you um, What's that in English? I'm lacking proper word. Um, recognition when, when you do a fine synthesis. But I would also like to encourage the supervisors out there uh, to really say, oh, that lab, the data collection that you have there is really easy to understand. That's really nicely laid out. And uh, when we get another PhD student after you, uh, he or she can pick up from where you left. And um, some of you might say that electronic lab notebooks are perfect to do that, and that's absolutely true, but uh, it's not all labs uh, will be flocking to ELNs today or tomorrow. 
possibly and hopefully next year. But until then, and that's the main message uh, I wanted to give today, you can do good research data management with two days tools. You have the software for machine readable structures. You can export to uh, those non vendor specific uh, formats today. And all of that enhances your research data management. If you want to know more, NFDR for Camp has a number and a workshop series on research data management. So more stuff happening there as well. And uh, right as we speak, literally in this hour, uh, NFDI for Chem is uh, giving awards to uh, some people out there. That's the Fair for Chem Award. Um, here on the right hand side, you see uh, a wordle of all the descriptions of those data sets that have been uh, submitted. And uh, this is done together with uh, GDCH. Uh, the prize money was provided by the Fonds der Chemischen Industrie. And it's basically that we were asking people to uh, nominate um, data sets that had been previously published. And um, the call was open late uh, last year. Uh, we were evaluating the data set with a standardized questionnaire. Um, all the data sets were um, screened and assessed by at least uh, two reviewers. And then the top ones were uh, discussed in uh, and among the jury. The prize money is the checks are being uh, handed over today, right now at JCF by Johannes Liermann. And uh, the winners we had, uh, there was uh, Kausch and Giesmann. Uh, they had a paper on some cleavage catalyzed by something. The data set was published to Zenodo, which is another of these uh, generic repositories. You see there is a nice file structure that was associated with it. And uh, what is less human readable is this machine readable metadata that was associated with it so that you can uh, also find uh, those data sets. They even included the provenance information in form of a lab notebook. Now, because that lab notebook was done in 2017 and hadn't um, there was no electronic netbook out there, but at least they did provide that provenance information that we forgot to provide in our Hilgrofferon uh, data set. Um, there was a second uh, awardee, uh, that is uh, Kessler et al. Uh, they have DFT and uh, GCMS data on uh, some, uh, some uh, covalent organic uh, frameworks. Uh, again, there was a paper with that. And uh, there was a data set. This was submitted to the Stuttgart data repository, which is another um, generic repository hosted and operated by the University of Stuttgart. There is also plenty of machine readable data in there. Actually, the Wordle that I showed earlier, um, I didn't cut and paste around, but instead I was extracting that via a bit of um, command line computer nerdy geek stuff and directly putting that into this uh, Wordle thingy, which took just a few minutes. Um, and uh, you might have done that same by cut and pasting from those 10 uh, data sets we had. But if it was 100 or 1,000 data sets, then you really start to value that machine readable data where you can extract information. And in this case, uh, they had provided in that deposited data set a particular um, thing and script for the visualization. I was able to go in there. And this is what I actually did. I was running their entire visualization here on my laptop. And if in the paper they had this picture, I was able to generate that picture here on my laptop. And you see, I was able to change the color from black to blue. Um, I could also plot that in logarithmic scale. I could do this or that, or I could recalibrate and everything else that is the kinds of data reuse that I'm so much fond of uh, by being able to go to the data in question. And these were this, year, uh, uh, this year's uh, awards. Uh, we will have a new um, 
uh, version of uh, the uh, contest coming up towards the end of this year. So stay tuned. If you have a data set, then consider submitting that to uh, the contest. A caveat, uh, if one of the authors is paid by NFDI for CAM, you're not eligible. So we are really looking for the people out there. Stay tuned, watch the website, watch uh, Sonia's Twitter space. So back, my questions, my final questions uh, to the audience. Again, um, earlier I was asking if, if anybody knew anything about uh, data reuse. Maybe now I'm asking if you have a data set out there. Drop the URL or DOI into the chat. Um, talk about it in the discussion. Uh, tell us what you liked. Um, or tell us why you published that. Did you really want to? Did somebody ask you to do that? And uh, what was good in the experience to do so? What was less so? Would you expect it to be easier in the future? Maybe that had been your very first data set you published. And is there anything where NFDI for Chem can help in the future? And with that, I'm at the end of my part. Thank you very much.